Hi everybody, my name is Woody Bevel and um, I know I don't show it but I actually am old enough to have been a mechanic on the Nike Hercules missile. Um, the Nike Hercules missile is a surface to air or surface to surface, it's dual mission um, Army interceptor. Here you can see one of the more recent photos probably from the middle 80s because all three of these are trainer rounds. The Army's Q5 is a target missile. This is just a short video of a high altitude intercept. Guided from a missile control station, Q5 can simulate a great variety of supersonic missiles. Count how long that first stage burns. The Nike Hercules, the Q5 target was carried aloft by a B-50 bomber to give it a boost in speed and altitude. Nike Hercules, the Army's highly accurate solid propellant air defense missile, which is replacing the Nike Ajax, is raised to launching position. At the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, it rests on its launching pad in readiness for this test interception of the Q-5. As the B-50 reaches maximum altitude, the target is released. The Q-5 first falls clear, then after the booster's fire, its powerful ramjet engine will shoot it ahead at more than twice the speed of sound. He says ramjet, but it's really just an old V-2 buzz bomb. See the pulses. Nike Hercules, in more than 500 test and training firings, has demonstrated an amazing ability to seek out and destroy various. All right, that was stage stage one, one separation there. Anybody count how far that boosted? This about six seconds. About That's 44,000 feet. feet. Target speed in excess of 1,500 <laughs> miles per hour. All right, so what you didn't see there was all of the rest of the paraphernalia that goes into a Nike Hercules battery that enabled that thing to fire. I'll walk you through a little bit of that stuff in the next handful of slides. The next page I'm going to show you here is a mm, crawl, walk, run. This was just kind of like doing push-ups and dragging your knees along before you crawl, where the U.S. government, Defense Department, had figured out that the Soviets had ballistic missiles that they wanted to shoot at us. This was back in the 50s when there was a false missile gap and the Army decided that they wanted to build a missile defense capability into Nike Hercules. So they worked their way into firing a corporal surface-to-surface -surface missile at a Nike Hercules battery and they used the Nike Hercules to intercept the corporal missile. Now the corporal missile is a surface-to-surface no, it's not. I'm thinking of Jupiter. <laughs> but um, in this particular test that you're about to see, um, you might want to flash back into a little bit of the um, Twilight Zone, black and white, narrated type stuff, because that's how old it is. This test was flown in 1957. And remember, we just, we just looked at how long the boost was in the first stage, and that was a six-second boost. See if you can tell where they spliced it in this next video, because it's not a six-second boost. All right, coming up. Tests of the improved Nike Hercules system are currently underway at White Sands Missile Range to prove its technical capability of intercepting ballistic missiles. The test you are about to witness is the intercept of our early type. Does anybody want to see an alien pop out next? Nike Hercules. The Corporal, which is a Field Army type ballistic missile, stands 45 feet high. So I was right. It is a ballistic surface to surface nuclear, nuclear missile. Miles. I think this one is liquid. The nuclear capable Nike Hercules used for this test will carry a high explosive. This one warning. is an HE round. They said it's nuclear capable, and it is, but this one New is HE. I can't tell you how or why I know, but you can glance at it and see. system to acquire and track high-performance targets. Target ready. Target countdown. Fire. Target on the way. 
An army civilian team at the Nike Hercules site. That miles means that the active duty weren't smart enough target, to run it. Only 30 inches in diameter and more than 10 miles up. Target acquired. Do you have confidence in that analog technology they're using here? Target tracked. Fire. All right, look for it. On the basis of tests Did you see where they cut it? The improved that wasn't a six Hercules second boost, was it? Shows a technical <laughs> capability of intercepting and destroying enemy ballistic missiles. All right, what you see in here are these two little pointers, and targets. when they get opposite each other, that's when the intercept occurs. It's just a visual indicator. They actually draw on white paper that they replace after every launch. All right, so what is Nike? It's a big honking missile. It's got four booster rockets. It's 41 feet long. The second, the second stage, which is the, the main stage, if you see in the background on the left-hand side of this table, you'll see the white part of the rocket. That's the part that's 21 feet long. I'm uh, sorry, 26 feet long. The booster is 21 feet long, and um, it's, it's got four massive motors in it. It uh, puts out, where do I have that in here? I thought I had it in there. Ah, oh, there we go. 978 newtons. Am I reading that right? It's 978 newtons? Kilonewtons, Kilo Kilo Newtons, yeah. yeah. So where's the center of pressure on that thing? Uh, it's very much in the back. Uh, what you're looking at, is, if you see at the top of the table, you see the, the obvious first stage booster at the back and is green with four, four multiple motors. Those are the actual motor skins, and they, when we put it together, we just bolt the top piece on and the back piece, and then screw the, the, each one of the fins and the booster together. Each booster's got eight bolts when you screw it together. But it's drag separated. What you can't see, there's this little white um, hole here at the top of the booster, the first stage booster. And in that hole, you'll see the white part, that's the back end of the second stage. And we would have to connect a quarter inch cable to a clevis hook on the green part where the motors were for the booster to a snatch pin in the, f in the second stage and the drag when it burns out the drag from the booster would separate the two snatch the cable out and ignite the first stage uh, sorry the second stage and that's why you would see a, a nice long coasting gap for drag separation motor ignition pressure and then thrust and the, e neither one of these photos neither one of the videos had a very good representation of how this thing really flew. It went straight up to 44,000 feet, separated, ignited the motor, and when it ignited the motor, it would flip over and fly horizontal until it reached where it needed to go. Um, a in a few minutes, I'll show you the architecture of, the, of what the rest of the battery looks like. But you can see the range here, 90 miles. That's statuette miles downrange. And in the surface-to-surface -surface mission, there are photos and video of a red 4x4 post with a 30-gallon galvanized garbage can bolted to the top of it. And you can see the nose of the rocket going into the garbage can before the, before the crush range trigger the, uh, the warhead. Like I say, this was a wonderful missile to play with. It takes a crew of about eight people most of a 12-hour day to put it together from scratch and, you know, crack open the boxes and put it together. In school, it took us a week. <laughs> and like I said, this thing is massive. You don't get a scale of how big this thing is until you're trying to push it around on those rails. This page is showing you the basic layout of a, pa of a Nike battery. See, I almost said Patriot because when I got out of Nike, I went into Patriot. Um, in the foreground, you'll see this little... Uh, bottom left hand corner you'll see a golf ball looking dome that's where the high power radar is in the first in the second video you saw a, a swiveling radar inside of a dome that's what's inside this dome and it was used to surveil long-range high altitude aircraft and then on either side of it you'll see some some equipment and those are the trailers and generators and things that power the radar and the electronics that are in the fire control area as well as control the fire control where they identify the tracks, they identify the targets, and engage them. 
As you move further deeper into the middle of the picture, you'll see three other smaller golf balls. One of them is a missile tracking radar, one of them is a target tracking radar, and the other one is a target ranging radar. So they didn't quite have the signal processing or the radar know-how to combine all of that into one radar like today's modern fire control radars are. And over to the left, item five here I think it is, yes, you'll see a low power antenna. Bef the difference between the two videos, the first one was an original Nike Hercules and the second one was an improved Nike Hercules. The difference is the golf ball and the high power radar. The original Nike only had a low power radar. It could barely detect tracks and we're talking massive tens of B-29 sized Soviet bombers at 60 miles. The improved radar, you could track massive tens of Soviet B-29 sized bombers at 120 miles and have enough time to engage them at the maximum range. Remember they were carrying nukes and our goal for this missile was to nuke the entire flying squadron of bombers with one round. So as you get to the middle of the picture here, you'll see a uh, kind of a separation area between the battery control area and the launcher control area. It doesn't look like there's a lot of room here in that photo or in this drawing, but the actual difference, distance was no closer than five statuette ground miles. And that's because the missile is so fast in that six seconds of boost that the, tar that the missile tracking radar had to be able to lock onto it before it was fired and track it as it goes up. And if it was any closer than five statuette miles, the missile would outfly the radar's ability to, kit, to track it and guide it, and then the missile would fail safe because it didn't have positive control. So in the launching area, you see items two and three. That's the uh, flight simulator group and a trailer-mounted launcher control station. This trailer allowed the operators in the launching control area to control up to three different launching sections. You can see down at the far end, they got three different groups of, of four launchers each. So this trailer is, was manned by, I think, three to five people. And uh, they would control remotely. They would raise and lower the launchers. They would manually select with big rotary dials and, switch it, dials and switches to go from launcher bank one, two, or three. And then they could raise or lower individual launchers in that selected bank. Over in the left, you'll see a, what looks like a berm, a couple of cutouts. That was the missile assembly building and the warhead, warhead building. My job and the job of my peers was to man the launcher control area and assemble and repair the missiles. So I lived in the, in the launcher control area and in the, in the uh, missile maintenance building. And in this, this picture, you can see a better not quite better, it's really old drawings. It's about as good as you can get because this stuff simply doesn't exist anymore. But you'll see three different launching sections. And inside each section, you'll have a, a rail. A, it looks like a railroad track, but it's about three feet high. And the missiles would roll along these rails from left to right. And each section had one launcher or erector. So what you do the operators would push the missiles off to one end of it and have one on the launcher. They would erect it and fire it. And then they would, they would remotely lower it, deselect the bank, and the crew members would run out to that bank, push another missile onto the launcher while an adjacent launcher had been erected and was firing. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I did not want to be around anything that could go to 44,000 feet in six seconds when it was really about the length of this building away from me being fired. When I was in school, they showed us uh, a video of what happens when these things blow up on the rail. And it was a deliberate denial and self-destruct test. And they took an army demolition charge, a shape charge, and they put it right on top of the warhead of the center missile in the center bank of three launcher sections. And you fire off that shape charge. These are all, all nine of the missiles were high explosive. The shape charge, you only needed one, would destroy the warhead, of, obviously, that it was on. That warhead would destroy the two adjacent sister, launcher, sister missiles. They would destroy the other two launcher sections. One of, the mo one of the rocket motors from one of the boosters on one of the far end missiles was not immolated immediately, 
and it broke loose like a child's balloon was turned loose and it completely destroyed the rest of the site. No, it was, a, it was a successful denial and destruction. We had to train to destroy the site because by the time I was manning it, the mission for Nike had changed. And our mission was to nuke the East German border to keep the Soviet war machine from rolling west into us. So we would only have enough time to get off one nuke and then we would have to destroy the site and go become the Army's next in newest infantry company. So here in this photo you can see some various and sundry small little blobs that say surface access hatch and uh, missile test set and some other small things. I'll get you some more detail of what those are here in a handful. So when you get down to the individual section, this picture has got four of them here, but you see the single launcher and then you see the, the, other, the other three missiles in a hard point where they're anchored onto the rails where they can't slide around when the one on the launcher gets fired. When these are fired, it breaks the sound barrier twice before it ever leaves the rail. There are two booms. Out of the 32 Patriots I fired, I only ever heard one boom. So it was much faster than Patriot. Okay, here is more of a CONOPS wiring diagram of how the battery and the radars work. I pretty much described most of this. The high par and the low par here on the right hand side of the figure would detect and identify groups of aircraft that were coming in flying from west to east to go bomb the Western Europeans and start World War III. And then the target ranging and target tracking radars, the two smaller golf balls here in the middle, would pick out the center parts of the bomb of the fighter or bomber squadron that was flying and then they would lock onto that and then they would lock through the computer system into a point in space that they would that the target that the missile tracking radar would steer and guide the interceptor into that point so in the first vid in the second video where you saw the two horizontal pointers moving vertically and they lined up that's what's showing you is the distance in slant range between the target, the guide two point, and the interceptor. And of course over on the far left you can see the launcher and you see the rocket motor, the booster stage one where it falls. Now when we set these batteries up we had to lay them out and we had to map out where the first stage would fall. And back in the early 80s when I was going to school they still hadn't recovered most of these and the booster drop zone for one of the launching areas out in McGregor Range where they still fired those things, it looked like the uh, Sequoia Forest out in Tucson. The things would nose in and because the cases were red hot and melty, they would just flop over and it looked like the arms of a Sequoia cactus. Uh, they cleaned all that up in about 85 and there's just not there anymore. But everywhere you go on Fort Bliss or McGregor Range, you'll see this big cigarette butt ashtray rocket motor nozzle and it's from the rocket motor boosters on from Nike Hercules because I had so many of them. Here's a close-up of the launcher. Uh, the picture does not do this thing justice. It is absolutely steampunk, massive, heavy steel. Uh, this trunnion bearing at the back of the launcher, which is the bottom left of the picture, is probably a foot in diameter. The hydraulic pistons, there's two on either side of it, are six inches in diameter and there's four of them. And when you turn this thing on to erect it, it screams because it's so much hydraulic pressure going through those valves. It, take, it would take the launcher with the round on it 45 to 60 seconds to go from horizontal to vertical. Here's a different view of the same thing. You can see how the rails line up on it. And here in the, about the center of the picture, you can see two big plugs that, where the cable assembly is pointed. Those plugs are each, yeah, they're each, each plug is about eight inches in diameter. Each plug has maybe 25 or 30 pins in it. 
and they're hooked together in this big manual thing that holds them both together. And as a crewman and an operator, in order to become qualified in the MOS, this was the most difficult thing to do. You had to be strong enough to hold it in there, slide it in, and lock it down in 10 seconds. Now, 18-year-old me only weighed 106 pounds. I damn near failed. <laughs> Here you can see the insides of a subsurface Nike Hercules battery. If any of you go to San Francisco, there is a Nike Hercules batter, battery subsurface magazine on the north side of the bay. It's a national park and you can go down inside this magazine. If you ever go to San Francisco on vacation, you got to go there. And it is a piece of Cold War history. Inside you can see various uh, boxes where you would individually control each launcher. Once each launcher is put where in, in the condition it needs to be, the operator would throw a switch which enables the, that piece of it to be operated remotely. Then it would all go back into this bunker that's off to the bottom left of the, bottom left of the photo here. And that's where a big test set is that would control all of the launchers in that section. When all of the crew were in that bunker, they would secure the doors. They're about two feet thick. You've seen the old uh, Cheyenne Mountain videos of the big bank door that's closed on a hydraulic. That's how big the door was because you got 978 kilo newtons right above you getting ready to be launched. I don't know about y'all, but I never wanted to be there. So here's a little bit more of the missile. Now, I can tell you that this photo is for a nuclear missile. They're very carefully not calling attention to it, so I'm not either. But it's got basic sections of the missile and pieces of it. The forward fins are there, not because it needed it for center of pressure or stability or aerodynamics, but it was to support the four antennas and some pitot tubes for measuring barometric pressure. And the antennas were one on, each, one on each fin so that as the missile rotated to do its flight, there would always be an antenna in range to the missile tracking radar. If it didn't have a I love you pulse from the missile tracking radar every 10 milliseconds the guidance and control unit would fail safe and destroy the missile. And this is a better view of the booster. Here in the top le bottom left of the picture you can see the call out for the rocket motor igniter. These look like a paper, paper bowl but they were hard plastic. It's a pound and a half of plastic explosive with an igniter. We would screw those in, wire them up, and then connect the cable to the control harness that would go down to the side of the launcher. And these igniters were so sensitive that you had to ground your hand, you had to ground your body to the launcher, you had to ground the igniter to your hand and the igniter to the launcher before you ever picked it up. Just doing like this, uh, brushing your hair out, of, hair out of your eyes, would create enough static to fire one of those things. They were incredibly sensitive. Um, to hook one of these things up to actually fire it, there was a massive procedure to go through in order to take any stray or spurious voltage out of the launcher control wiring or out of the missile itself before you plugged it in. It was such a dangerous job that out of the entire battery of roughly 200 people, they always chose the youngest single soldier to do it. He's expendable. You would have to stand just forward of the fin on the bottom left. And fortunately, if you did make a mistake, by the time you realized your body had been cut in two, you were already melted. Here's a picture of the motor and um, nice uh, burn pattern inside that motor. That's how it got so much thrust. The funny thing about these is towards the end of the life of Nike when we would raise them up for our weeklies, the, the, f the, motor, the fuel was so brittle and old, you'd get chunks that break out and rattle out through the nozzle. We, of course, would light them with our cigarette lighters and watch it burn. 
And here on the bottom right, you can see where the igniter is and how it was screwed in. I don't think they ever had any motor failures where the igniters would burn through on the top. It seems like a weak point to me now, but I don't think they ever had any failures. And here is a picture of the second stage sustainer. It had a nice good star pattern in it. This thing was awkward to install into the, boost, into the main body of the rocket. We had a piece of handling equipment that would fit up into the tail of the nozzle far enough that we could lift it up and balance it and still insert it into the motor, uh, into the casing. This is just a picture of the ailerons in the back and how, how the thing was steered or controlled with X and Y pitch and roll commands. When we assembled it, we had to also assemble and prime the hydraulic system that, was, that would power these. We had a hydraulic test set. And the acronym was Pumping and Filtering Unit, so we always called it a PUFU. And to hook that thing up, you just get nasty. There was no way to hook it up without getting hydraulic fluid all over you. But we would have to run it and filter the hydraulic fluid for four hours before we could certify the, the guidance and control system to work. And during the end of that four hours, we would have to hook up a radio frequency test set to feed the antennas and the guidance control system the commands to do roll, pitch, climb, dive, and various commands and ensure that the right elevons moved in the right position when the correct commands were give, given. Otherwise, we had to disassemble it and do it over. Uh, this is a basic blast frag warhead. It's brutally simple. There are no moving parts. Um, at the bottom of the mo rocket motor, up under the warhead section, are, is a little opening mail slot door. And every day, we would have to open that door stick our fingers in it while we held the door closed and hold up two pieces of uh, explosive material that were G-switches. And we would have to eyeball them and make sure they were still safed. Now, what did you do if they were armed? We've well, already got your fingers on it. There's nothing you can do. Um, those were called M60s, and we would have to test them once a month. So once a month, you take them out, you put them on the end of a four-foot stick, swing the stick around, and if you hear it snap, it armed. You let it stop, let it sit for about three minutes before you let go of it, and you hear it snap again, it saved itself. Then you can stick it back in the weapon. Okay, if you remember the subsurface magazine, I talked about a, control a launcher control console. This is the console where you can select any of the launchers that were in that section you can see the big analog dials and some various and sundry bulbs there. That switch is a little, con a little bit um, understated. It's about four inches in diameter and it's a foot long. And it's got 65 screws and connections and wires connecting to it. One of the post tests in the mechanic school was to successfully replace one of those. Underneath the, underneath the kick panel is a blower fan to cool the whole thing off. Now, behind all of this analog technology are some serious vacuum tubes and a lot of heat, so we had blower fans to cool it. Then behind the kick panel was a blower fan, and one of the other tests was to replace that. And there was an interlock switch for the kick panel that the blower fan wouldn't work if the kick panel was off. It would shut everything down. And if you didn't pull the interlock switch out to cheat it, you would still have energy on the blower motor and the capacitors would really wake you up if you didn't set the interlock switch. That was my first introduction to safety. Here's a section control. So each launcher had the controller and now this box controlled the three sections that each had a, section, had a launcher controller. Same thing. We're still not at the trailer that was in the first picture of where the, where the launcher section was. This is an individual launcher controller. Basically, all you could do here was after you plugged the missile in and erected it, you could throw a switch to make it 
to enable the remote control of that launcher with one of the other two stations. This box was about three feet high, about four feet wide, and about seven feet long. And because being in Nike Hercules was so entertaining, we had so many things that we could not make up, my wife took full shameless advantage of it and wrote a book. And it's a, uh, some of it is true, a lot of it is true, some of it is made up. And if you read it and ask me, I'll tell you which parts are true and false. And that's it. <laughs>